Peter, you want to come up? I want to make sure you got dressed for the camera this morning. <laughs> the rest of us don't think about it, but he was a professional camera operator and teacher and I don't know what all I'm going to find out, see? But uh, we haven't known Peter very long, so I'm not sure if we know him, but <laughs> he uh, just started showing up at our church a few weeks ago. And, uh, we've gotten to know their family a little bit. You've gotten to know one of their boys. High energy kids, but uh, amazing. The whole family, I mean, I was just like super impressed the first time I met them. And uh, still sort of walking around in amazement when we're in their home. But I just want to give him a chance to uh, share his life, his testimony, his you know, ask him a few questions and give him a chance before he leaves. He's got some health issues and he's struggling with some of the environment here. Uh, we wish he could stay. We can't talk him out of it. We don't push him too hard. But <clears throat> Otherwise, we'd be kidnapping him. But anyway, um, grab that microphone there. Okay. Get you started. You can use this one when you're done or whatever else. But, you guys uh, don't sit down. Can you all see me if I sit down, or do you want me to stand? It's up to you. Well, the camera's true. Yeah, see yeah. Like to do. you can see it either way. If you ever make sure. I'll try standing, and if I, if I get tired, I'll sit down. Okay. Why don't you stand so that you sit on the table, so you on the table. There you go. There. There. I'm always a little nervous to sit on the table. Right. Oh, yeah, okay, but just be quiet. Lay down flat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 It's not bending a bit, I can see. I might, I might start out, you know, Floyd asked the question yesterday, why are you here? And I had to think about that for a minute because um, I really wanted to, Floyd told me about this about two weeks ago when I first started coming, I really wanted to go, but I, I had some health issues even before now. And I said, yeah, I'm coming, no, I'm not, yeah, I'm coming. And then about um, three days ago, I said, you know what, I got to go. And so I had to think about that question. And I know that um, he was telling me that Amy Simsack was going to be here. And unfortunately, she couldn't be because I really wanted to pick her brain about some things I've been struggling with. But um, I, I think when it came down to it, I, I, was I telling you about this, Julie, or somebody, I said, Ultimately, I'm, I just came because I'm, I'm searching for my next step. That's why I mentioned for um, 15 years I've been working at a Midwestern University up in Illinois. Um, I worked in an academic technology unit and I was a videographer and media production specialist. So I'm not used to sitting on the side of a camera, right? It makes me a little nervous. And I'm like, <laughs> what I, I gotta look presentable for the camera. Like nobody cares, but. Uh, so yeah, this is this is kind of an experience. So for 15 years, 99% of the time I've been on that side. And this is a, a rare opportunity where I'm on this side. But yeah, it came because, um, you know, a, a year ago at the university, um, they, they've always been in trouble. I mean, they don't know how to balance a checkbook, and so that affects the universities, and they had to downsize, and I, I got hit with a termination, and it took place about two weeks ago. So I'm like, what am I going to do now? And in, in trying to answer that question, I've been struggling with my health and, and um, just just to be frank with you, if, I, if you don't mind my, 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 honest, my honesty, I've been really kind of ticked off and, and angry with God. I've been struggling with anger. And for those of you who've been on the health journey, I think, or any, any whether you've been on the health journey or not, um, maybe you've been angry at God too. I saw it in your face. Yeah, uh, maybe you maybe you could read that. And um, so, and I don't mean to exemplify that, but it's been a struggle for me because I'm like, why me? Why am I going through this? And um, sometimes that question even now is, is still a little hard for me to understand. But, you know, about, probably about, I don't know, six to eight weeks ago, I don't know, I don't remember when Nina started coming, but um, my wife Nina, she wants to fellowship with churches, and we really haven't been in fellowship with any group of believers for about eight years. 
And so she said, I want to go to this, this Seventh-day Adventist church. I said, oh, great. You want to go to a cult? Great. Okay, you can go ahead. <laughs> you know, because that's that's what they teach about the Adventist churches, even where, where I'm from. And so she goes, and she says, hey, I met this really cool guy, Floyd, and she knows how to get my attention. She says, can you go just to see if his theology is okay? I mean, it was kind of a um, sweet way of manipulating me to go because she knows I don't like darkening the doors of the church. So I went, and, you know, Floyd wasn't there, Wayne was there, and she said, you got to come back. And I recognized him right away, and I said, I remember this guy. I saw him last March, about a year and a half ago, and I was really aggravated by him the first time I met him with um, Bill Dewey, yeah. um, fit to serve a community garden group. Because he had this passion for God that was annoying to me. <laughs> and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't understand it because the God that I grew up with was an angry God. And he made me afraid. Um, I grew up in a Catholic household. And, you know, unfortunately my father passed away a couple years ago, but not before I got a, had a chance to make things right with him. You know, I saw him kind of melt away after fighting Alzheimer's at a young age. But, um... I grew up in a household that was very fearful, and the God I knew was a God of vengeance and fear. And so I, uh, I didn't know any better, I guess. And I, I became a believer in '98 um, after some soul searching and really struggling to figure out who I was at 22 years of age. And I bounced around for about many, I don't know how many churches and denominations and whatnot that I've, that I've visited, but I was trying to. I, it's interesting, it's almost ironic, I read it, and nothing against the Catholics, because I know a lot of good Catholic people, but I read the Catholic Bible and it convinced me that what I read in the Catholic Bible was not what I saw in the Catholic Church, so I became a believer as a result of reading the Catholic Bible, which is, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> and so I went on a quest from 1998 to present, trying to find the God that I read about in the Bible. And so... Um, 2008, I quit going to churches, and I, I tried to get in 2012, and I helped a guy sort of kickstart a church, and it didn't last, and I remember that's when I started getting sick with these unknown symptoms, and I think the reason I quit going to any churches, and I kind of gave up after that, is I remember, I mean, I think the, the man met well, and he said to me, well, you know, I don't care how sick you are, even if you have to come lay on a pew in the back of the church, you need to come, and I said, but my Bible says that the elders need to come and anoint me with oil and pray for me. So I just quit going. And that's, that kind of became the last straw for me. But I have a wife who is very persistent and she wants me to fellowship with people. <laughs> she wants me to fellowship with people. So 2012, I made some bad financial decisions. I quit going to church. I was angry and I just kind of took the spiral down and my health just started crashing. And by 2013, I was, I was really sick. The house that we live in now that uh, Floyd and Tanya and Keith and Enoch have all visited us in, um, I remember pretty clearly, um, one day my uncle says to me, hey, I know you guys need a place to move, come check my house out, I'll, I'll rent it to you for a good deal. We check it out and the next day in 24 hours I'm having convulsions, having headaches that all lasted for months and months and um, started losing weight. Um, and. All, all kinds of myriad of symptoms, and they, the doctors could not figure out what was wrong with me. I was dying, I was losing weight, um, I dropped weight, I got from about 225 pounds to about 155, and they just could not stop the weight loss, and I, I thought for sure I was a goner, and I started asking God, well, who are you going to have replace me, because I can't have my wife and four kids without a father. My wife was determined, she's not going to let me go, and she says, no, you need to quit saying that nonsense, we're going to find you help. Um, so I kind of left the, the world of the medical system, and I think that the medical system is great for trauma in this country, but not so good for, for long-term illnesses and prevention, and so we ended up in the world of alternative and natural medicine. Yay! And um, we, we met a lady from Idaho, and a family member, or a family friend said, I think you're probably suffering from Lyme, and so they put me in touch with this, this ministry out in Idaho. Good, some good believers, and I've never met the lady to this day. I only know her as know her voice, and I call her the blind lady. And she saved my life because she coached me back to health. She sent me a life device, and she started teaching me about natural health. And I remember telling her, "I, I want to go to school for this. This is a passion of mine. I want to really bring the ministry of healing 
into the church where it's which absent. And she says, well, you know, I, um, I understand that you're in, you're in class right now, you just don't know it. So by 2014, when I was, um, you know, really probably at my worst, she sent me a right device and I started following her advice and I slowly started regaining my health. I decided I wanted to take classes and um, took some classes and classes in naturopathy and finished my um, finished my coursework in that. But then um, by 2015, I found that I was laid off from from the, from the university. I was I was really upset. So um, somebody said, "Well, look, you know, regardless of what you think, that's the Father's will." And for me, it was. It, it, you know, I see you, you're saying, a lot of you who I've talked to say, yeah, um, that, that makes sense, that, you know, that he's preparing you, he's got to get you detached from the state. And i got to tell you, I, you know, having worked for the state for 15 years, it is hard to let go of that because I had great benefits, I had a great job, and I lived really, really well for that. And now, with an uncertain future, you know, you said something to me one time, I think you may have been in a service, when you, in, or, no, we were talking, I remember talking to Floyd, it was probably three or four weeks ago, he was in fixing something in our house, and I started all my ranting about conspiracy theories, and <laughs> Floyd kind of steered me away, and we, we started talking about the difference between searching the fa for the Father's hands rather than his face. So a light bulb came on. I've been looking for his hands, and what I really needed was his face to understand you know, my next step. It was, it was a really big distinction that I, I've never made before. And that's, that's where I am right now. It's, it's, it's a struggle because, um, and I remember telling you last night, Jubilee, that um, and I told Enoch and Keith and anybody else that I've talked to, I'm, I'm in desperate need of his, um, the, the next direction. And, you know, by December, I want to make sure that my, my family's kind of got the next steps figured out. But I also know that the greater need is to figure out, to get to the core of why, why I'm angry and why I'm glad I've been fearful. So that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm just, um, you know, I I don't I don't say any of that to, to you know to get anybody's sympathy, but that's just kind of where I'm at in my walk. So when you asked that question yesterday, you know, why am I here? I'm I'm just looking for my next step and trying to figure out who I am and what I mean to him and what he means to me. So that's kind of. Uh, in a nutshell, I mean, I, I can answer any questions or whatever that you have. Hallelujah, that, that God is leading you. I, I know I'm a healer in some capacity, but, you know, ultimately, I remember, it, it's funny, I don't know, again, if it was you or someone else, I do believe that I was talking to, what do I really want to do? Because one of the things I've seen in the world of natural health, and sometimes I think that alternative health practitioners are just as guilty as sometimes as the medical profession where, you know, right. in the medical profession it's either drugs or surgery. But in natural health, we play doctor with herbs. I see it too many times in, you know, people who need help. I'd rather that if they come, come to me that I can pray for them and not have them continually come back to me. I would just rather see a, a prayer of, of, of healing and that they get, they get better quicker, right? So I, I don't know. I mean, like a lot of people, a lot of I have a lot of uh, colleagues who, who run clinics, and you know they do really well. I, I'm, I'm just not. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure yet what I want to do. That's so. not. Um, <laughs> in dealing with the state and all that kind of stuff, jurisdictionally, um, running some sort of educational facility, some some foundation like that, in terms of liability, is it's far less than actually you know practicing. Agreed. Yeah, totally different world Agreed. legally in terms of uh, regulations go. If you have to deal with the state, right? Um, you can still advise people on the side, explain what maybe you would do if you were in their situation. But uh, it's a lot easier to just have school and train people what they ought to be doing rather than actually practicing. I would agree with that, and I, I think my heart is is education. So coming from a higher education background. Um, you know, in higher ed, when people saw me get sick and they were curious how I got well, I mean, it's a mystery to them because they looked at me and they, when I got really thin, they, they thought I was walking death. I mean, I should have died. But, and so that always prompts the question of how do you get better? And for me, I want, 
I want the health education to be part of my testimony in my ministry. You know, really. Yes. Yeah. I would also say that in the educational side, you can reach many more, more, more people in the same space of time rather than just having one come in and then another. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you were working while you were really ill, though? I was. I should have been. Well, so. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> My wife would have to take me to work, and I knew that I couldn't afford to miss the days because I had I had medical bills to pay. So I go to work with uh, grinding headaches for months, and I would somehow get through the day. But that, that's just how I did it. And uh, so true. Yeah. He saved you. He did. He kept working you to death. Uh, possibly. Possibly. I, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I think he saved me for a purpose, you know. Thank you, you know. Um, I'll play as we share something that may be helpful. Uh, I have a friend up in, um, you know, the same time I live in. He ran a clinic for maybe 10 years. Uh, I, I call it a clinic, but what it was was he bought a uh, ski lodge. Um, we had it long since uh, in the past. Turn that into his home. The you know a huge place like this, and then uh, decided he would try to help people with uh, uh, diet, uh, exercise. Uh, later he grew a garden, uh, and uh, he started to run into a problem. Because he was, he was really blessed. Uh, he was a building contractor, by the way. He wasn't in the natural. He and his wife were committed. People were getting better, but he knew that he was still missing a component. Uh, and after his, his work closed, he recognized, actually, no, I'm sorry, it was toward the end, uh, he realized he was missing, missing the spiritual component. Yep. So he had a. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think there was a ministry that was done in his, uh, in his uh, home and had to do with uh, forgiveness. So he had a few more uh, guests uh, came and just amazing uh, results. Uh, and I remember one story he shared this woman who had had this terrible um, quickening maybe some type of arthritic situation. Uh, and she couldn't give him do more than two stairs. And he uh, spent time with her, I guess gave a talk on forgiveness, I think. And uh, that evening she resolved, it was a terrible secret she carried all the time. Uh, she told her testimony and uh, how she had forgiven this person who had done this thing to her. Uh, and it was that day or the next day, she could walk all the way to the top of the stairs, no pain. She did her seven. Do you remember the story? No, I don't remember that story. Uh, and he's been in touch with her, that's been 10 years ago. And she's, she's still, still doing well. Still doing well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Floyd, you may remember more. Yeah. Those people also did uh, hydrotherapy and juicing, well, you know, raw food juices, and natural alternative yeah. treatments to help the people that came. And they were having quite a bit of success with success. people with cancer. And, yeah. You know. yeah. And ran into a few dangerous situations, too. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Legal thing. The Lord's Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would, I would have to agree with you on that note that what I've seen in my own life is I've, I've thrown thousands and thousands of dollars at this and a lot of people were surprised and they, why, why can't you get through it? I mean, it's been four years. Why don't you go take the vaccination or why don't you take the antibiotics? And I, I've heard it and, you know, yeah, I mean, sometimes I felt like that, but, you know, my wife's like, my wife and some other healers in the naturopathic world are like, you know, the thing you're missing. I said, yeah, it's a spiritual. I mean, I know what I know what I've got to, you know, get through to uh, 
to be fully healed. It is a spiritual side. It's the issue that I have with the Father that I, I believe that once I rectify that, that I, my healing will be complete. And it will also, you know, kind of complete who I am as a person in the, the, um, the next step in my life. So I, I know that's where I'm at. But, um, you know, I, like I said, I've, the one thing that I, that I do want to be able to change um, through education, like, like you said, and, um, is that you can't cure something with herbs or food or juicing or whatever if, if, you, can, if you don't get the, uh, the spiritual side fixed, no, nothing, um, nothing will be complete in a person's life. They're starting to see this with cancer and Lyme everywhere. I mean, that's why they, I don't remember who I was telling them, they've got laughter centers and the healers now and the doctors are starting to be trained in, in, in some of this, even in the medical world. If you don't have that component of spiritual, mental, emotional healing, it doesn't matter what you do physically. That's, you know, and I, I appreciate all the insight everybody shared with me because I'm going to take that with me when I, when I leave and um, remember that. So I just want to get up and tell everybody that I appreciate what you've shared with me. It makes, it's going to make a difference. So we're on the three to do it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We all have to help hold each other up. So, you know, yeah. Tom. I would just say it's okay to be angry with God because He can handle it. And you, you know, you need to forgive Him for what you perceive as, you know, Him doing or allowing. Um, but Job had a lot of the same questions you do. Right. You know, why? Why? I'm a good person. Why did this happen to me? You know, and God was there for me. Showed up and talked to him. I haven't been brave enough to go in my room and scream at him for 10 minutes like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been tempted. Yeah, I'm the one to pick up rocks and just throw them. I'm angry about this. I'm angry about this. I mean, because the truth is that I know, okay, I But the truth is, you're angry with God because he's the safest person in your life that you can rail against. When you get that anger out and you just blow it somewhere safe, the kids don't see it, the wife doesn't see it, and nobody sees it. It's safe, it's there. You get it all out, then it will dissolve in your tears. Well, tell us what uh, what natural healing have you really become convinced of? I can tell you what I've studied, and I'll tell you what's worked. Um, most, you know, I remember uh, about two months ago, I, I kind of thought I had it really nailed down. I did a presentation to a, a functional medicine group of doctors back home. I thought I really had this line stuff figured out. And then I came here and I experienced the oxygen therapy and I was blown away. I mean, I think oxygen therapy is going to tell me Keith and Enoch that I, I think I'm going to try to get my hands on one of those devices, but oxygen is something I haven't thought of, but um, I think when it really comes down to it, uh, again, I, I've tried everything, but what's worked is what's really kind of kept me from uh, the brain is uh, the Rife device, and it, it falls back on the idea of frequencies and vibration and um, resonance and it I don't know if that if that if that um, technology or that concept makes sense but it's it's the idea that it's like a woman who's singing in an opera and she hits the right key and the glass shatters mm -hmm. and that's the way that the Rife device works is it hits the the frequency of the microbial organisms in your body and it shatters them without hurting it. And so I use that device for probably a year to really push it back. And where I see the next generation of, of healing, even without addressing the spiritual, mental, and emotional, is the world of frequencies and resonance. And even medical, medical is very resistant against that in this country. The alternative is even starting, not everybody understands that, but to me that's, those devices that I've seen, um, and a healer, there's a healer, there's a, actually there's quite a few healers up in Michigan. I, it must be Healer Central in the central United States. There's a lot of them, and I know a group up there from um, Detroit that makes some of the most amazing devices I've ever seen. Um, I, for me, that's what has worked the best without addressing what I know is the core problem. So um, that's where I kind of see the future of healing going in this country. 
uh, if, if the resistance will come down against it, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Is the charge for it in the UVR? What's that? The charge for it in the UVR. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't cost enough, that's why it's yeah. accepted. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the drugs are what's making the money right now, which is yeah. why so much goes there. But, um, some of, the, some of that technology has shown up in clinics and it is starting to make its way into hospitals, but they're few and far between. Um, Europe is really ahead of us on, on that, that, that uh, field. And Mexico, some places in Mexico. Yeah, Mexico really is too. Yeah. Yeah. It's just when I think I've learned everything I need to know, something else new comes along. I remember you and I talked about that. We, we, um, there's something else, and I, even though I'm, I've been angry with them, Mad at him. And I do talk to him a little bit. For whatever, for you know, he still guides me and he still guides me in the right direction. And I, I can't I cannot deny that. You know. Otherwise I, I don't believe that I would be here. <laughs> so well, you can always bring your wife back here and just say I could. <laughs> What's that? I have all the contact from this board. Oh, appreciate that. <laughs> no. So, we don't know. So, when do you want to do the next step? What next step would that be? <laughs> <laughs> I'm being facetious. Why don't we let him tell us? <laughs> Terry, Terry Fivish's book has, has been helpful and I've been reading it and trying to apply that. I'm still kicking against the, uh, I think they're more like bricks because <laughs> it's going to be kind of hard. Wrong source. <laughs> well, if you keep talking about your health, uh, tell us about your life. You know, where were you born and raised and... and born and raised? Raise your wife. Okay, sure. Yeah, and I'll get back to your question because I don't think I want to leave. I just don't want to leave. What's that? It just hangs there. Yeah, I know. It, it hangs there constantly. Uh, born and raised in um, Coles County in Illinois, the central, east central part of Illinois. Um, Charleston, Mattoon, or Cole area. That's from here, that's uh, five and a half hours. Uh, I live in Mattoon right now. Uh, met, my wife is from, uh, she was an army brat. She was born in uh, Washington, D.C., and her father moved around a lot, and they, they settled up for Chicago. And she came down, he gave her a four hour radius when she graduated from high school in 99. And she came down to where I, actually where I work now. We were uh, both students there, and I, I met her at a, a bonfire at a, at a uh, church function. And we dated off and on, ended up marrying her in 2002. And we have four, four kids, three boys and a girl. And I told my wife I would, I would never spoil that girl, but uh, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fulfill that. <laughs> She's got me, her little girl's got me wrapped around the finger. Um, this is one of my boys, Josiah, who you've all had a chance to meet. Was, you know, come up here and sit. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very huggy guy. I mean, he, he gives lots of hugs, so if you need a hug, this is the man right here. You want to sit down? Pull up a second. see how we get through. What else do you want to know? That was really brief. <laughs> what, 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 I'm, I'm just straight. Do you have what, a what, what, What's that? Do you have siblings? I do. I come from a very large Catholic family. Um, Six brothers, two sisters. Whoa. Yeah. And, um, Where did you fall? I was the third, the third oldest. Yeah. My uh, my mom was one of seven. My dad was one of eleven. We were raised on a farm in Central Illinois. We were corn and soybean farmers, and lost the farm back in 2003. Part of part of my journey too is, um, you know. Again, I go back to a conversation that you and I had before, where we were talking about, you know, you, you talked to me about your father, and it made me think about mine. I didn't have the best relationship with my dad growing up. My dad was a very hard man, and 
raised us all out in the country, and I mean, he took us on the trips. He worked for seed companies. He worked on the family farm, and he raised us with a hard work ethic. So all of us are we're hard working um, kids, but you know, it was a hard relationship with our father. I mean, he was pretty strict. And so I kind of hated his guts for a long time. But I remember on a, you know, back when, probably about 2007, I was on a, I went over to his house on, a, on an Easter that they were celebrating, and I forgave him. You know, I said, Dad, and I had never told him I love him, and I gave him a hug, and I said, I forgive you. And then right after that, they diagnosed him with, with uh, Lewy bodies and Alzheimer at 57 years old, and he slowly melted away before my eyes. By the time he passed away, um, I was just it was heartbroken because I feel like I could have done something about it if I had known, you know. But um, I was, I have to say that, you know, in many ways I thought I, I had forgiven him for everything, but I, I don't remember who I was talking to. I think I was just angry at him. I told him, maybe it was my wife, I told him, I said, I was angry at the guy for just giving up. I'm like, why did you give up? You left mom, you gave up. But I have to think that my relationship with the Henry Father is a direct correlation with my, my, yeah. my, my dad. That being said, I mean, I, I still, still very much love and appreciate my father. I'm sad to see him go, but it, his, what I saw happen to him was another reason that, um, that I am, you know, I'm like, I don't want to have that happen to myself. I don't want to get to the, the point where I'm so depressed that I, I melt away, you know, like that. So it's another reason that I, I push forward, you know. So you said that was really brief a minute ago. What do you want to know? You got me. <laughs> what are, You're what, just now. I like the long version of the story. Which which long version would you like me to share? Because I probably share the longer version with you, most likely. Are yeah. you close with any of your siblings? <laughs> Not really. Uh, my sister, I have a sister back home. You remind me of my sister. My sister, uh, my sister, she's a great, great young woman. She, uh, she between her and my wife, um, they kept reminding me to my, I don't know, like, disgust in some, in some cases that God needs, God wants to work things out with me, and I didn't want to hear it. But um, mm -hmm. she will constantly call me on the phone and remind me, hey, you know, I've been thinking about you, I've been praying for you, I think I've got something I need to share with you, so don't get mad at me, but, you know. <laughs> but, but God loves you. Me. Yeah, God loves you, and now you got some more proof to start. Yeah, I, know. I, I, I may be opening a can of worms here, but uh, my uh, between her and my wife, they've they've just been uh, just great women in my life back home. You know? That's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, how is she? How how is she? How is she and how was she when you were a little boy? That's an excellent question. My mom was a very good woman. I mean, I could not. My dad, you know, you probably heard this growing up. Dad would say to me, I hope you marry somebody just like your mom. And, you know, he thought it was kind of a big joke, but I did. Like, any, any of you folks that I've talked to, I, uh, I prize my wife. Like, she is, she's like an angel to me. My wife, if it had, you know, she, she'll tell you. If you hear her side of the story, that she was raising five kids for the last four years, I was one of the kids because I, I got kind of, I don't know, she'll tell you that guys are bigger babies when we're sick. And maybe it's true, but um, I, I became very I became very needy and whiny. And when I didn't feel good, I mean, she gets to hear from the kids, but when I don't feel good, I, I get very agitated and fearful. And, and she has to put up with that, but she, she took me to all my doctor's appointments. She took me to work when I shouldn't have been working. She took me to my courses, she, um, you know, we spent thousands of miles on the road and um, a lot of time together. And I got a text from her the other day said it's been a long four years, you know, so I, I have to agree with her, but she, she homeschools, she's super mom, she gets, you know, she, I go grocery shopping with her sometimes. I, I'm blown away at, at the kind of woman that she is because she is that Proverbs 31 wife. She is so rare. I just don't know a lot of people like her at, at 34 years old. Uh, for those of you who are not married, you want to find somebody like that. <laughs> you married? Yeah. You married? You know, if you're going to find a single. Yeah, you want to find a Proverbs 31 wife. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's hard to find. But. I'm telling you, not 
because I specifically know what you're talking about. I just know the opposite of what you're talking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. No worries. But um, but back to my mom. She was she was a good woman. You know, she uh, took care of the kids and. Did she love you? She never really told me that. Did you know? In our family, the, the words "I love you" were never really used. We just kind of knew. See, it was we. My, my my wife gets agitated with me because when she, in her family, they grew up telling each other they loved they loved each other, and I suppose they showed that in our family. You just didn't say those three words. It's not like you didn't mean it, but you showed it. You demonstrated it. So there's this kind of bumping of heads sometimes where I don't say it necessarily, but I I prove it. Like I have to work to prove it. I believe so. I think I think the anger that I have with my mother is that she didn't protect us from our father. That's real true. That's yeah. also the anger the problem we have with churches. Because we tend to pin God with That's, our I never father's about that way. We tend to pin the church with our mother's characteristics. So we need to be careful about that too. And realize how the church is not mama. All the way it's the woman that gives birth. The church is not mom. And your daddy was your sperm donor and your earthly parent, but long before your heavenly parent planned. I'm gonna level with you though. You know, I I think I think my frustration and I my mom was eight miles away and I never really go to see her and I I've got issues I gotta sort out with that, but So you might forget her too. Yeah, probably I, no, definitely I need to do that. My issue with churches is um, you know, I, and I, I've been involved in leadership with the churches, I've involved in missions and all kinds of things. So I got sick of the hypocrisy, you know, reading what the Bible said. Because again, I've been on a mission since 1998 to find what I read in the Bible and where do I see that? Where can I find that? I just haven't seen it. You won't find any church that has. No, and I realize that. But I got I got really ticked off at the nonsense and I just, just quit going. And I, I wasn't interested anymore. I understand that. To my mother? I don't have any idea. Okay. Well, anyway, just little thoughts okay. that can open it up because we subconsciously we act out the way. We act out patterns over and over and over again until we finally get to the core of it. And we're stuck acting out patterns until we blow it out and get it real and get it done. Right. Okay. I didn't really catch what you said about uh, you and your wife because um, I guess a lot of people don't realize how they need to you know, say I love you and I need you and I'm so glad you're in my life and things like right. that. I was by myself too much and <clears throat> one day after I got home from the feast I started to get on my knees to pray. and. The Father has spoken to me many different times in my life, not out loud, but real, real strong to my conscience. And God said, you need, you need to be more loving and caring. Mm -hmm. And we need that. And it comes back to us. So I had to think and be aware of the, more about the needs of others and, and not just doing something, you know, like a man not just making a good living, but saying things, you know, to make people, uh, to comfort them and make them feel wanted and needed. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I can't remember what. Tell us a story that is a little bit from the life. A story that shows what you think you like, what you think is your what is your belief mantra that you always say that drives you? What is your belief that is who makes you who you are? Mm -hmm. Of course, playing with that one out. But you need to know what it is so you can decide whether it's right or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Boy, it's a tough question, I think. I can tell you my tendency, which, which might help you understand that. Um, my wife gets really aggravated with me 
because she'll try to serve me something. I'm like, no, I'm going to do it myself. Let me do it myself. And so the way that I live my life is that, well, and it, it, it kind of ties back into God. I don't, I don't believe he's going to do anything. I mean, it, the way I live my life, I don't believe he's going to do it for me. Therefore, get out of my way. I'm going to do it myself because if I don't, who's going to do it? And that's what that's what drives me right now is I'm, I'm having a I'm having a difficulty trying to believe that he's going to make a way for my family now that I'm underemployed and boy it is hard to get away from the state I got it is hard to get off of that one but I was so well taken care of by the state now I've got to figure out I feel like I have to figure out how to make a way for my family. And my struggle is, but I, I don't know how. I mean, one of the discussions Floyd and I have talked about that is like beating my head against the wall is the state's like, they got a carrot in front of me right now. Hey, I got state disability for you. You probably qualify, but you got to give up all this information. And I'm like, man, that just seems like a red flag right there. And I don't want to rely on the state, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't trust the father well enough to provide for my family. So because of that, my father was always the breadwinner, and he provided until he got to the point where he couldn't, and he left my mother, like, destitute, the way I look at it. So maybe I'm kind of mimicking that right now. Did, did he? Yeah, I don't know. Did you pick up the pieces of your mother? Did you and your brothers help her? Try. Okay. Try to. So you just did what you could to fill in the losses. Sure. Good. Yeah. That's good. In some cases, you can begin with all of it. Where was his insurance policy? Where was his plans? Where oh, yeah, I mean, she's she's okay. I mean, in terms of all how all that goes, but... Um, she's lonely. Of course she is. She always has been lonely. I would, I kids, would agree with you. When your kids left, that's it. Yeah. So she needs grandkids. She needs, she needs hugs. She needs to be baby. <laughs> I, would, I would say that's well. probably true. But in terms of how I live my life, I, I don't trust anybody to do it right except me. Mm -hmm. Just being totally honest. Well, you were taught to be independent. We were Fierce, taught, fiercely independent. Yeah, we were taught to be too independent. And too many times I turned uh, people down. But I made sure I smiled at that little boy and said, I will baby you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you know what it, what it comes down to right now is I can no longer be fiercely independent because you know I've given my wife the, the leeway now to she's been kind of taking the charge and sort of running the family in, in, in my absence and now I'm like but I gotta find work I gotta find work I gotta find something I gotta find that next step and I have until December 31st and I gotta do it I gotta do it I gotta do it and we've had this conversation so many times <laughs> so. But if you live long enough, you'll find out that I have right. that I can't trust myself to do it either. <laughs> Those facts are identity. Yeah, facts are identity because I have a friend that we got acquainted with a few years ago. Uh, lived in Charleston. He married this wonderful young woman with two kids, and they had another one. And uh, they were just, you know, a great family. And we, uh, they were very honest, and very sincere. <clears throat> and uh, I introduced them to some new information about God and some resources, and they got really excited. They moved to Florida, <clears throat> and. Uh, decided to join our church down there and then um, and he is a very fiercely independent person. He was strong, he was uh, good looking, you know, um, fiercely looking out for his family. And on Christmas Day they, he was going to go out to play with his kids and he put on some roller blades and went about two feet and broke his leg. Spiral fracture that never healed. Um, in severe pain for several years. I went down there a few times and worked with him and he would 
we would carry cabinets into a house and he'd be gritting his teeth and almost in tears with the turbans of that, but he wouldn't admit it. The last time I was down there, he was trying to carry granite tops around and he broke two of them because it hurt too much. And I'm like, you have to ask for help. You've got to stop being so proud and so independent that you're not willing to ask for help. Well, about a year or two ago, he was staying in the parking lot of the church and uh, through a very freak accident, uh, a friend of his got in a pickup truck and started backing out, died while he was doing it, and ended up smashing my friend into his own car, oh. crushing his pelvis into pieces, broke the upper part of the same leg that was broken already, and uh, they had to life flight him and his son to a hospital for like a nine hour surgery where they filled him full of pins and screws and tried to put the pieces back together. And so I watched a fiercely independent man become more and more incapable of caring for his wife and his children. And I tried to encourage him. And I talked to him a few days ago. And it was so encouraging because he is trusting God. Um, and he is watching God. His wife left him at the beginning of this year for another man, living on drugs and alcohol, lying to the children. And he's just he said, I cry every day. And yet, he's learning to trust God. And the last time I talked to him, he said, you know, it's so wonderful. My, my second son, which not really his son, but you know, he treats all of his kids. He's their only real father now. And uh, he's finally started able to see them again. And he said, my son has natural leadership capability, and he's starting to sense it. And I'm watching him open up, and he says, for the first time in my life, when he's hanging around me, I'm hearing him say things that I've taught him. You know, that he heard me saying, and he's taking, he's, he's like saying them back, for real. And the other day, he, he took his two sons into a house that God is miraculously providing for him to live in and fix up for free. Actually, they're going to pay him to fix up the house. And he was showing his sons around and surprised them because they were so excited. You know, this is like the dream house. They always articulated that they wanted to live in. And after they were exploring all the bedrooms and everything, and then he says, hey guys, guess what? I'm going to live here. And you can come. And he says, don't you think that's cool? He says, besides, it's not only free, I'm going to get paid for staying here. <laughs> he, says, he says, don't you think God is good? And he says, for the first time in his life, the son just had a huge grin on his face. He says, yeah, yeah, he is. And he said, my son is starting to open up to God. I've never seen him do that. And this family is going through trauma right now, and we're praying for them. And I'm praying for his wife. You know, she is hijacked by the enemy. Yes. And, and yet, I'm watching God deal with the spirit of independence that blocks us from the very thing we need the most, which is humility, vulnerability, allowing God full access to every part of our life. And we're afraid we're going to lose identity if we don't stay in charge. If we can't prove ourselves, if we can't earn affection of our families, or if we can't prove, and he said, he told me, he says, you know what? I had to give my kids to God. They're not my kids anymore.
because he can do so much better job than I can. And I have to keep reminding myself where God's kids in my mind. And he says, God is doing it. I didn't say all that as a threat. <laughs> no, I don't take it as a threat. But God's had to do similar things with me and with other people, and I'm coming to realize that the kingdom of heaven, the very essence of the atmosphere of the kingdom of heaven, we think is love. But the part we don't want, but is absolutely impossible for love to exist it is vulnerability yeah. which is the opposite of independence mm -hmm. and we are terrified of vulnerability because for obvious reasons right we're, we're going to be exploited or we're going to lose our identity but we need to lose our identity because we already have a much better identity, it's in Christ. And what we think is our identity, what we depend on, what, you know, our achievements, our abilities, our independence, all that stuff is a fake identity. And it's like eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, if you get your identity from that tree, I'm telling you, you're going to die because there's no life in you. That's right. Just come and receive the fruit from the tree of life. Just receive it. You already have your identity. It's already accessible. Jesus is the tree of life. He said, if you come to me, I will give you life more abundantly than you can ever possibly do for yourself. But he keeps reminding me, you have to become vulnerable. I can't. You Vulnerability gives God permission and authority in our life that he cannot have until we choose. And Jesus came and showed us how to live a vulnerable life, depending, totally dependent on his Father at every moment. And that is our struggle. That's my struggle. That's what you're describing. That's what everyone is. That's why when we're sharing the painful parts of our story, that we are afraid to talk about, we're starting to practice vulnerability. And that allows the Holy Spirit to come in and start forming bonds of affection between us. Because that's where we connect. It's not the wonderful things I've done that I can tell you about this. You know, you might admire that. But when I tell you about my brokenness, and then your brokenness says, oh, I know what that feels like. And I have hope because I'm not the only one experiencing it. It's, where, it's in the broken areas where we connect with each other. Yes, Teresa. Yes. Yeah. I, I just want to mention something from a nursing standpoint. When we have illness and go through things like that, it is a, there's five steps of grief. And, going through grief. And being angry is a normal reaction. Our body is trying to survive from the trauma of the illness or whatever it is, like if you have cancer or any major thing. Our bodies go through stages. And so it's not uh, abnormal to become angry. Just know that it's just a stage that in response to what you said, I was, you know, the whole reason I think I'm even here, if you, if, probably if you hadn't shared what you, your vulnerability with me that night you came over and fixed our seat for us, I would have thought you were fake as everybody else. Because mostly, uh, you know, and again, my, my experiences are, I just don't see that in a lot of men. A lot of men don't share their vulnerabilities. They share all the good things and all the great things about God. And I just don't see a lot of the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. But one thing I'm, I'm hung up on, and I don't, maybe I've told you this, but and I, I argued with my wife about this last night. So as you're, you're talking about identity, the one thing in my mind, I just it's, it's like a broken record, and I cannot get it out of my mind. 
and maybe my theology is wrong here, but before the people sat down in front of Jesus, he fed them fish and bread, and then he was able to minister to them. And I, my, my wife, I was arguing with my wife, why would I seek his face when I am in need of his hands to provide what my family needs? Did not Jesus provide the needs for the people when they were hungry? I mean, I, I, that's spinning like a broken wheel in my head. I, I can't get past it. I'm, I'm really struggling with that thought right now. You can go read the story. <laughs> it might take, I'm probably taking it out of context, I imagine. Because when he fed them, it was after he went to them. It was before. I thought it was before. He, he talked so long. <laughs> oh, that's right. That they started getting hungry. They were hungry. And he talked right through supper and dinner and everything else. And they were, and then the disciples like, okay, okay, he's long winded, but we don't have any money, we can't feed these people. And he's like, so? You feel it. <laughs> he was testing it. And that was a long, weary day that he was such a good speaker that that's why thousands crowded to hear him. He, he was. <laughs> breathtaking, fascinating. They felt love. When you're around love, you feel it. They might feel it. They were receiving life from him. No, yeah. they received life. Um. Oh, I just wanted to read Matthew 10, 29 and 231 because it's encouraged me. And not only did Jesus talk about this, but he talked about the lilies of the field and how they're clothed. Yep. Better than Solomon was. Um, but this says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. For that he sees, he sees them. He cares about the little birds. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than before we moved away from Michigan, a group of us used to meet in Keith's house and spend two or three hours every once a week or so. And uh, we were all together sort of on our own journey, collectively, trying to have a closer walk with God, trying to learn how to make sense out of life, um, how to heal our, you know, find healing emotionally, spiritually, to begin growing. And something we started doing that was so powerful, for me anyway, was uh, we would, whoever was willing, we would put our name in a bucket or hat. And, uh, and then we would draw a name out, and that person would tell our story. Mm -hmm. And we said, we want to know your story, you know, from a spiritual standpoint. Yes, you know, the physical stuff, but how how that affects your spirit. And we also don't expect you to have a nice tidy end to the story because <laughs> most of our stories are in the middle. Mm -hmm. So we can't give you a nice conclusion happily live after after. You know, we're stuck, we're screwed up, we're we got questions, you know. <laughs> we're very definitely in process with unanswered doubts and things. And that was totally amazing because I can remember stories people shared and we had no clue what they had been through. And as they shared their story, we just had this affection, awakening, sympathy, you know, compassion. Uh, as we resonated with their story. And then when they finished their story, we would ask a few questions just for clarification, not to fix them or anything, but, you know, just sort of flush out some details. And 
And then we would invite the person to sit. We had them sit in the center of the room. And everybody would gather around. And we would just bless them. And invite God into that story. To bring the healing, to bring the hope, to bring the answers to, to just
and love of the trust. Just like all those people in Revelation say, you are worthy. Thank you. Father, we are so grateful we can stand here together. And you have told us to that we are more together than we are here there. Plus, Father, we ask that you are going to thank you. We thank you for the power and courage you've given us. And we know, Father, you have that beautiful verse. And I'm going to find that towards you. Father, please, not of evil, but give you an expectant. Then you shall go and come to be one friend and I will heart for the friend to be here and you shall see me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So make that come to you in here and this whole family is the case. Thank you for the love and the human being in this world as if there were one person in the world. And thank you that you have the 99 who will search for the one who shows us how very valuable they are in your sight. Oh, of course, so good. And we just love you and we stand up. But we need to know you're going to open the door. Thank you. 